And I had the pleasure, I had heard about this Marvin that was out there in the world <laughs> and, and who was an amazing human being. Really, and, and, and that's why we, we, we talked about how we interact and, and how we kind of break down those walls. And so I was, I, I was, I was warned that I was going to be meeting someone that is really, really special and unique and that is full of joy. And so when we got introduced, we introduced on email, and immediately Marvin's like, can we, can we talk on the phone? <laughs> I, want to, I want to get to, I, I feel like I'm going to interact with you better over the phone. So we jumped on the phone and we talked for over an hour. <laughs> we talked for over an hour. We found so many things in common. We, sh I, I looked at it, we looked at the work together and we kind of discussed what was going to hopefully happen here today. And we get, went through a couple different titles, right? And then we, we landed back where we kind of started and it was the joy of making portraits. And uh, Marvin has gone through every, from shooting everything at Disney to shoot each other Washington Post and everything in between. And I think, you know, it's a special skill, really, to have sometimes 30 seconds and hopefully sometimes 30 minutes to, again, interact and, and put yourself forward and hopefully give back. You know what I mean? It's not give and take. It's give and give. And I think you are a shining model of that, and we're really looking forward to your talk. So let's give a round welcome to everyone to Marvin Joseph. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, first of all, I want to thank BNH for inviting me to be here. I, I can't believe I'm up here. You know, I'm usually down there. You know, I'm fangirling from the audience. Now, now I'm like, man, I'm missing the shows. I got to be out. <laughs> this is great. Um, I'm going to say a couple of words before I do the uh, this slideshow, um, just to kind of. <laughs> so funny. We used to write our notes down, and now look at me. I like read it for this. Um, so I'm Marvin Joseph. Um, I started at the Washington Post in 1996. Can you believe it? August 26, 1996. And my highest paycheck in my life at the time was $411. And I thought I'd hit the lottery. That was, you know, I was like, oh my God, I make so much money now. And I was 18 years old. So you can just imagine. I don't know where the time went. I was 18 years old yesterday, and now I'm 47. So, you know, I done grown old, y'all. I'm grown old. Um, I, uh, you know, I started photography when I was 14 years old. Um, one of my science teachers, you know, showed me a camera, and that was it. It was like Spider-Man becoming Spider-Man. I got, got bit by the bug, and I've been loving photography ever since. So um, anyway, one of the first exhibitions I saw, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit here, but um, Annie Leibovitz was the first exhibition that I saw. We had a place in DC, it's still there, but it used to have the museum component, it was the Corcoran, School of Art of, of the Corcoran. And that's where she had an exhibition. One of the teachers took me there, and then I started following her work at the time, and I wanted to do that kind of work. So I kind of wanted to do portraiture and stuff like that. I had no skills for photojournalism, any of that. Um, I ended up getting a job at the Post at 18, and I, I was working there as what we call a copy aid, which is administrative work, like answer the telephone, you know, uh, <laughs> deliver packages and ice cream to the reporters. That was my job. Um, and I think I didn't make it a year yet before I went to the photo department. What happened, each department, you know, style section, metro section, um, sports section, they have what is called a news aid. And it's the same thing as a copy aid, except you work specifically for a desk. And so you filled it phone calls, so you would get the crazy phone calls that Elvis is still alive. You know, I had to answer all of those kind of calls. But anyway, um, when I met one of the photographers, um, of course, I lit up because I had been doing that since I was in high school. So from I was known as Picture Boy at, at my high school. So that's how I always had the camera with me. And anyway, um, I got a job at the Post. I met one of the photographers. And to condense everything, that photographer said, you need to meet your, this person who became my mentor. And so from there, the rest is history. Like this, it was a lot of tough love, a lot of training to teach me. So I kind of learned photography, then photojournalism. And I always liked portraiture, always. I always wanted to do Annie Leibovitz, Herb Ritz, the, the whole nine. So it's kind of full circle now because I still do photojournalism for the Post, obviously. I'm still there after all these years. But I have a specialty, which is usually portraiture. 
So I'm going to read a couple of things, and then we're going to get started. So I start off with just about everybody in this room has taken portraits before. Portraits of the moon, flowers, cars, trees, and yes, grandma too. What on earth would we do without our beloved movie poster and magazine covers that almost always include a portrait of some person? I picked up a camera at the age of 14 and have been smitten over photography ever since. I photograph literally everything, just about anything, y'all, with a Pentax K1000. It was all manual, didn't have nothing special about it. You had to learn all of that jazz. Um, then I saw my first exhibition that included the works of Annie Leibovitz, then Herb Ritz and David LaChapelle, Irving Penn, Richard Avedon, and countless others, some of which are attending this very convention, have all inspired me in my work. Today I'll show you all just a glimpse of some of the fun I have behind the camera and the joy of making portraits. Music maestro.
Well, where do I begin? Any questions so far? That's quiet, no questions. Did y'all recognize any faces in those? So I, yeah, I'm still like, uh, to this date, I'm still in shock that I photographed Merrill Street. And I can promise you I was extremely nervous. But she is like us. She's really, 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 really down to earth. She'll sit here and have a beer with you. She's really cool. But I didn't know that before I photographed her. So I was really, um, that photo of her in the, in the batch there, and I probably, I was wondering if I should put the laptop up and show like, some of the pictures again if you, in case you needed to see them again. But anyway, um, I remember one quick story about her. She, she had this really tough publicist, and a lot of times, the celebrities have, <laughs> you gotta kinda get through the publicists because you can't get to them without the publicists. And they can be really tough. Um, so you ha I had to be nice to the publicists um, and to have this nice moment with Meryl Street. And I remember um, as we were taking pictures, I, I wanted this, I had this photo in my head that I wanted to take of Meryl and I was so scared. I was like, I want her to lay down on this chaise. So I didn't know how to ask her. So. It was so funny because whenever I'm scared, I get crazy. So I just blurted it out. I was like, Meryl, can you, can you lay back like this? And she goes, like this? And then she did it. And that's how I said, pow, 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 pow. <laughs> So that's how I got the photo. But it was, it was out of pure scare. But you know, after a while, I'm, I'm used to it now. I like people. So it's, it is one of my gifts. So it's, you know, I tell everybody to kind of like, Try to find everybody's funny bone, you know, and, and whatever it takes to break the ice. Um, I remember Bette Midler, I had to photograph her here at the St. Regis, and it was the same thing. I'm like, oh my God, it's Bette Midler, I'm so scared, you know? And on the outside, I can play it off, but like on the inside, I'm freaking out. Um, but what I did was I had a buddy who works here as a photographer in New York. And I remember he, he helped me on the shoot, he was my assistant, and I asked him, I'm like, okay, we gotta get some roses. And because one of her albums is Bette Miller Rose. You hear some photographers talk about with, when, it, when it comes to celebrities in general, it does help to do your research. And that helps to like break the ice maybe, um, maybe get a funny joke out of them so you can get a nice picture. Um, so I knew Rose was one of, her, one of her albums. So I was like, okay, we gotta get a bunch of roses. And so um, what I did is I had him stand like right here so that as soon as her foot stepped into the room, the suite we were in, that I slammed roses in her face. I needed something to break the ice. And, and, and one, I'm like, if I get this part done, I can get the pictures I want. So sure enough, she steps foot in the room. And it's like, bam, I got these roses for you. And she's like, oh, oh my god. And that was it. I was like, and I look over at David, got her. Come on, let's go. <laughs> so you got to find little ways to kind of, with, with um, with the celebrities, you know, you try to find ways to break the ice. And if you have in your head an idea, you're trying to actually capture that. You know, um, you, none of us really want, you know, to just stand there and go click, click, and you're done. You want something special. Usually, you want something special. So, fortunate for me, I have tons of friends and family that I practice on. Every time I get a new lens, new lights, new cameras, they're the first people I call. And I have a plethora of camera hogs. So I'm, I'm blessed in that way. I can call just about anybody I can call. I got new gear, and they know what that means. So um, all of my practice with lighting and experimenting with gels or yeah, everybody, my mom trying to cook. I'm like, what are you doing? I'm, I got to test the gel out. So I'm taking pictures of her. So everybody falls prey to my camera, you know, in my, in my, in my Marvin spear, you know. Um, and I'm fortunate, I'm blessed in that way. I encourage everybody in this room to, if you wanna do all of your genius lighting techniques, your trial and error, use your friends and family. I've been doing it for decades. That's, so that way, by the time I get to Michael Keaton, I've already done the light setup. Meanwhile, everybody else thinks you're a genius. They don't know you've done this picture like 80 times. You know, in the lab, in the lab, you've, you've tried it out and you know that through your trial and error with your experiments, this is how you get these images. So um, there's, there's a lot of that. I talked about, um, you know, earlier about themes. You know, sometimes it helps when you're out taking pictures. 
you use themes as a way to practice, and also it flushes out a photo essay sometimes. So let's take something simple like the color red, all right? What can you do with red? You can do a lot of stuff. You can do red on red. You can do red against black. You can do red against green. You just, you can use colors. Um, I like contrasts. I like taking things, people, that don't belong with something. So, you know, I may take, you know, oh, you know what, let's take this bright red wig, put it on this lady, and put her next to a canary yellow wall. So I like things that are just crazy that way. Or let's, let's take bubbles and put it with a guy. You know, only bubbles are for kids. You know what I mean? Just, just random stuff. And so the random stuff actually helps me create, you know, pieces of art or just really cool images. So for me, it's all about creating just really cool images. I want to have a body of work that I can say, you know, I actually like that. And we all go through phases where one minute, like, gosh, I love this and now I hate it. You know what I mean? Or, wow, that's so like five years ago. I don't even shoot that way anymore. So it's so funny. You go through like these peaks and valleys with your work. Um, but the most important thing is shoot, 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 shoot. And I probably shoot a good five, six days a week. So I'm working five days a week, and then my days off, I'm shooting for myself. You know, just finding something to shoot. And if I don't have anything, I will find something. You know, I'll call somebody up. So, um, there's, so you know, experiment a lot, too, with your lighting. Also, I, I mentioned to break the rules, the supposed rules. You know, you can't shoot into the sun. It's backlit. I'm like, let's do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you never know what it's going to turn out. A lot of my stuff is what if. What if we tried this? What if we do this? What if you lay like this? What if you take your jacket? I have one of the models, Brianna. I'm like, you know what? Take my jacket and put it on backwards. Let me just see what it looks like. So I do stuff like this all the time. It's not, I, don't, I wouldn't say it's anything new, but I think that um, it, I think it helps, you know, try to get the creative juices going, get the wheels turning, and it helps you try to figure out what you might want to do. So any questions so far? Hi, thank Hi. you for your works. This is so beautiful. Thank I you. like it so much. Yeah, there's a lot of art there. Um, my extra question, I'm curious, like how much time you had to shoot the girl on the horseback? Oh. <laughs> yeah, like how many seconds before she fell? Like, so she <laughs> did fall off the horse, by the way. She did fall off the horse. Oh. So the cool thing, I was fortunate because the, um, the grass was overgrown. So the grass was super cushy. So, and she did, she was barefoot, and that's why she slipped. So the course was kind of slippery. She fell off the horse because she slipped. But she didn't break a bone at all. She, she just, yeah, she was fine. We were like, we, were, we all panicked. We all panicked. It was like, because I had people standing by just in case she would fall, they could catch her, right? So that's what their jobs were. Like, everybody stand near the horse, make sure if she falls off, you can catch her. We're standing there shooting, I'm taking pictures, and they're doing videos. So, I'm like, how did she fall and nobody caught her? It's because they were doing videos with the iPhone. So anyway, she was fine. She did fall off the horse, though. Yes, she did fall off the horse. We were fortunate because the grass was super, super thick and cushioned. And it cushioned her fall. Yeah. She, so she, we got lucky. She didn't break a bone or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you for being here. My um, pleasure. I had a question. Have you ever had a situation where you kind of uh, basically fall in love with a photo that you take of a, a client, a model, uh, and then maybe with the publicist or that model, they absolutely don't like it, but you're in love with it. What, how do you deal with that type of situation? So, um, so what I've done, okay, we had a situation where um, every now and then we have some celebrities. And they, okay, so because I work for a news organization, it's different from when you work for you know, GQ, Vanity Fair, Vogue magazine where it's understood that there may be a little bit of, they have a little bit of control, but with, on the news side, they have no control over the pictures. They, they don't get the edit, they don't get the pick and choose. So what we do to try to make nice is, what I'll do is, because we're shooting tethered, and for people who don't know what that is in the room, you know, the laptop's there or, or your computer, and you have a cord from the camera to the laptop, and it pops up on the screen. So I shoot that way almost all the, all the time. So they see everything that pops up on that screen, which is why it's very, very important to make sure that your lighting, everything looks immaculate. That way, that, they can't complain about that. So the screen becomes your best friend because I've had celebrities test me a little bit, too. They'll say, um, 
I'll take a couple of frames and they'll say, because they've never heard of me or seen me before, so they'll go, um, they'll say something like, oh, you know what, can I look at the picture real quick? This is, if I don't have it tethered, this is one of the rare occasions. And they, you know, I just want to make sure my hair is right. They'll say that, but I know what it is. They want to make sure I've lit them and they look good. And so I'll show up and they go, oh, okay, yeah. And then they'll go back over. But anyway, what I do sometimes is when it's, when it's the celebrity and we're looking at that screen, um, one of the pictures was of a movie, very famous movie director, Ava DuVernay. And so we were doing, um, she was the one, we told her, okay, we want you to use these smoke bombs. <laughs> and she's like, smoke bombs? And she's like, I've never done that, you know? So sometimes you get stuff like that where some of the celebrities want to do something different for a change because they've done the same thing over and over with different photographers. And it helps that you try to come up with some kind of concept, something different. It also depends on like the mood or theme that you're going for. You know, what kind of, what's the mood here? What are we going for? What, oh, I have a new movie coming out. What's the movie about? Uh, maybe you want to use that mood to do these portraits of the, the director and or the actors and actresses. So um, anyway, back to your question. So one of the things I, I did with one of the celebrities, Ava DuVernay included, they're able to stand next to me and look at the pictures. And I can vibe on what they like. So I'm able to pick pictures that they like. And, and a lot of times, I like it too. So it's a little bit of, I'm able, by the time we do a, a selection process, I'm editing the pictures, I've included some of the images that they liked and in most of the pictures I like. And a lot of times, it's a, it's a happy medium. So I never really, I, at this time, I haven't had a situation where I had a celebrity say, I hated the pictures they used. I haven't had that yet. But that don't mean it can't happen, you know? But I haven't had it, and I think part of it is, I let people in on the joke. And that's another thing, like, um, if you have your concept down, you know, with the celebrity work on a bigger scale, mine is on a smaller scale, you know, I have, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. I'm lucky if I have an hour with a celebrity. But if I was working for Vanity Fair or uh, the Condé Nast publications, they have much more time. They're there four hours or longer. They have several outfit changes. And in fact, a lot of times, they really get to know the photographer multiple times because those photographers become even more famous. So they have more time with them where I'm limited. So I have to really walk in with, this is what I'm going to do, and in my head, have these shots lined up. Sometimes we even put the little pictures on the board, you know, the little mood board, and I walk the talent over and I'm able to say, okay, we're thinking in this vein. There's a picture of um, Chris Evert and Martina Navratilova. So that photo, um, we did, that was a, I didn't know the picture was gonna go viral, but it, it went viral back in July. The photo is um, those two tennis greats, they, they both had been best friends, then they were rivals, and then years later, they both had cancer, and they both got each other through the cancer, being really good friends. So I needed a photo um, to, I mean, Sally, Sally Jenkins writes this eloquent story if you haven't read it, but you'll, you can easily Google it and find it. It's, it, it. Everybody saw it and went nuts over it. But anyway, Sally writes this great story, but I needed a photo that could talk about umpteen years of friendship and, and, and love and hate, and we're, we're fighting cancer together as buddies. So um, anyway, I wanted to, and one word that came to my head was bond. You know, they have a bond. And so I had asked them to take their heads together. You know, I shot all these other photos, so the last photo I want to do, can you take your heads together, put your heads together, and close your eyes. And I remember telling them, feel the bond. I remember saying, just feel the bond, and I'm shooting this picture. And they, they laughed, and it, it was cool. I had no idea the picture was going to blow up like it did. But it was something that I wanted to do. Um, and it was a picture that I had taken in 2018 similar to that photo. So I was using that old photo that I had taken as, as like inspiration for that photo. But anyway, I used these things as concepts, some kind of you know, a one-word theme, something that can try to make something special. So. I have the oh. oh hi hi, hi. Robin. can you talk a little bit about your post production do you do your post production or and like how it, the skin tones look very natural they look really good can you talk a little bit about your post production yeah um, so I like um, I mean it's nothing like a black and white photo I'm a huge lover of black and white um, the I mean I try not to do a lot of I don't do a lot of post production 
also, my style, I like things a little darker and moodier. So I tend to like it, you know, it just, it makes everything a little richer for me. Um, because we, you know, we are fried chicken differently, right? We kind of have our own little salt and pepper and season on how we do stuff. So I kind of like pictures, um, and it varies on my mood. Like if I want, do I want things to be contrasty and bright? You know, do I want that look? Do I want it soft? Um, it just depends. It depends on where we're going with it. Colors, um, it just depends. Sometimes I want it contrasty. Sometimes I want it muted. So there, there's times you do desaturation on the pictures to kind of pull the color down some to feel almost black and white. So it just varies. But my, my tone and process, I don't have to do a whole lot of reproduction. I do a little bit of you know, darkening, lightening, like we do, kind of like the old school dark room. You dodge, burn, make things darker, make things lighter. Um, I don't have to do that much retouching, but there will be some on the celebrities because we need that when we're doing some of the big pages for the, for the celebrities. So there'll be retouching for that. But in terms of the tones, you know, I, I like the air on the darker side. Yeah. Hi, over here. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. wait. Um, here. <laughs> Hi, oh, there you are. How you Hi. doing? Hi. <laughs> um, so I was just wondering about the creative direction aspect. So is it that you are in charge of most of it, or you like work with people most of the time, or you kind of just have this idea for the most part? And if so, like other than doing research on the person, how do you find inspiration to really get these kind of new um, ideas that you take pictures? Okay, so the, I'll answer the last one first. Um, I like cartoons, food commercials, movies, Netflix, Hulu, all of those things fuel my ideas. I could be sitting on the porch and I see a June bug fly by and the colors of the June bug spark an idea for me. So I'm always looking for for little, like I take ideas from just about everything. I, I'm like, I'm a sponge for that stuff. So I look at a lot of pictures, I look at other people's works, um, but a lot of times it's random stuff. Like uh, I remember there's a movie, Snow White and the Seven Huntsmen. And there's a scene in that movie where Charlize Theron is the villain. She's like Queen Ravina. And there's a scene where she's in this milk bath and she rises up out the milk bath covered in this, milk stuff. And I was like, I got to do a photo shoot like that. And I ended up doing one that really cool. Um, the other one was direct art direction. Most of the time it's me, but some editors will have an idea of what they're looking for. So for example, the, the photo shoot of uh, director Ava DuVernay, actually the photo editor wanted to do something with smoke bombs. And we just had to figure out what color, what color did we want. Um, and then after we figured out that's the concept we wanted to go with, then we had to pitch it to her and her team. And then they said, yeah or nay. But in, in this case, she said yes. So um, with the magazines, a lot of times they have a creative director. And so they're going to already kind of have a concept in mind. And you as the photographer, you can actually have your take on it. And the two of you will kind of arm wrestle over what you want to do. Or sometimes you do both. A lot of times the editors will go with yours. They'll say, Dag, we were going to do this, but we like this better. So it still helps that all of us in this room always have concept and ideas in mind so that you could at least bring something to the table. A lot of times editors will hire the people with ideas. They, they just, it's just easier, you know what I mean? But they can, give you, they can give you a couple of nuggets. They could say, you know, weeping willow. And then you may say, I want a pink elephant. With the, wink, with the weeping willow. So you kind of come up with something, and they'll go with your concept. Not, I wouldn't say all the time, but a good majority of the time. Yeah. Hi. How you doing? Um, good. So it's nice to hear that um, other photographers out there still have nervousness, um, and I like that you brought that up, especially about Meryl Streep. So um, <laughs> I know you said you like to do crazy things, but are there moments where you're too nervous and you don't take the shot, or do you normally just do something crazy and that's how you get your image? No, no, you know, I, I think a lot of times um, it, it, it depends on like the time that you have, right? It depends on the time that you have. Um, with Meryl Streep, I shot, I had a simple gray background up and I had done, you know, stand here, do this, this, and this. And I, did, I hated all those pictures. 
because at the end of the day, in my head, I knew what I wanted from her. I, all along, I was just scared to ask. So in my 10 minutes, I'm doing all of this stuff. I'm kind of shooting the breeze. And I'm like, I really need to take this picture because it's, it's nagging me. Like this, I'm literally getting nagged because I was going to say, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to do this because I'm too scared. And then it was like I would have regretted because I would not have that photo today. And by the way, she loved that picture. She loved it. In fact, I had to photograph her like a few years later. And what I did was I had the picture sitting on the laptop. So when she came into the room, she saw it. I didn't say anything. I just, I just waited to see what happened. And she came in, and she looked at the picture and looked at me and was like, I remember you. And it was, that was it. It was a big, I was like, Mel, mom. You know, I was like, big old hug, you know. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm, it depends. Like, sometimes I think if I'm not, if I'm, okay, if I'm not a huge fan, I'm going to be calmer. I'm like, I'm actually cooler. But if it's Tina Turner, I, I mean, she gone now, y'all. But she, if it's Tina Turner, I'm, I'm going to be real nervous. It's Tina, you know. Um, so it depends, on, it depends on the celebrity and stuff like that. If I'm a fan of your work, I'm probably going to be nervous, you know what I mean? But for the most part, I treat every, I'm just going to hide it a little bit as best I can. I'm, I'm going to try, you know what I mean? So any other questions? In Okay. Oh. I mean, on the on the aisle. Hi. Hi. Um, seeing that you seem to be a fan of a lot, how much is assignment like surprise? We want you to do this person, and how much has it been that you've been able to kind of push your own project? Like, is there somebody that you wanted to photograph, and maybe that wasn't going to be an article, but they let you go after them? Yes. So her name is Brandy Norwood. Brandy was coming to the DC area to do Chicago. This was, I don't know, back in 2019, 2018 or whatever. And I found out about it. I'm like, we need to do something on Brandy. We need to do something on Brandy. So the style section was like, crickets. I'm like, I want to photograph Brandy. I want to meet Brandy and I want to photograph Brandy. So uh, what did I end up doing? Oh, I reached out to the Kennedy Center because they were handling the production. That's where the, the Chicago was going to be. So I reached out to the PR person that I knew and said, I want to photograph Brandy. Can we make that happen? So I figured out if I could orchestrate the photo shoot and get, the, get it done, it takes the legwork off of the style section trying to have to do all of this. So I was like, let me do this. So sure enough, reached out to, to Brandy. He reached out to Brandy. And Brandy was like, OK, we want to see his work. Because they don't know who I am. And then in two minutes, she said yes. And so we did a cool photo shoot. We did a, it's not in this mix. It's, I have so many pictures, I couldn't even, I didn't want to like give you too many because it, it would bore you and all of that. But it was, you know, it was really cool. It ended up being a huge lead. It was, a, it was a lead of the style section and everything. And this is something that I came up with that they weren't even thinking about. So. Right here. Back here. Oh. Hey, hey, Mr. Joseph. <laughs> um, have, you, have you published a book of your work? And if you haven't published it, will you strongly consider publishing a, a book of your work? I'm a collector of books buying about black photographers. So when you publish your book, I'll buy it. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, you know, I think about it from time to time. I, I, sometimes I get, you know, you get the imposter syndrome. You know, you kind of like, is this really that good? Is it okay? Is, would people really like this? You just never know. So it's one of those, I, I have to remember, I do what I do because I really like photography. I really do. It's the, it's the, it is, as long as I can do this for as long as I'm alive, I'll, I'll be a photographer. Like, I really like doing it. It's just the creative process for me is so much fun. Um, I think I get off on the creating, the, the creating aspect of it. You know, the work part for me for work is when I got to get captions. You know, like, let's say I'm doing the photojournalism part. I take this cool picture. I'm like, oh, man, now I got to get their names. And I'm like, walk over. <laughs> it's easy for me, but it's like, I just had more fun just shooting the pictures, you know. But I got to go over, let me get their name. OK, you know. And it's, it's easy, but it's like, the work for me is actually creating the pictures. So it's, it's the best part for me. Um, I thought somebody had hands up. Thank you so much for your work. 
Um, I'm curious uh, about the intersection of portraiture and uh, photo essay, photojournalism, and how you like to uh, bridge that gap. So um, that's a good question. And actually, I think that um, some, of your, some of your best photographers started in photojournalism. And they moved into other circles, like Dan Winters. You know, that's another one. There's so many that's like that. But um, I think one of the cool things about photojournalism is you are shooting things as they're happening. And this is the moment in time that it happens. And you can't, you can't interfere. You can't say, do that again. You, if you miss it, you missed it. The cool thing is when you're a photojournalist, you know what real life looks like. And I think with that perspective, it actually helps you create amazing portraiture because you can, you can direct the feeling that you're trying to get because you know what real life is as a photojournalist. So I think that's a tremendous help. I think it kind of, I think it does bleed a little bit into my work, but I think when you look at a photographer's body of work or a chunk of it, I think you get to see them in it too. I think you get to see their craziness and quirkiness too. I'm a quirky person and I know those pictures are quirky. You know, one of my buddies has blue eyes and I said, we gotta do something cool with the blue eyes, but something that's not, you know, something out of the ordinary. And I was trying to figure something out. I was like, I got some gauze. So we, I was like, I'm wrapping the face with the gauze. And then we did that picture of it. I'm like, okay, act like you're mad because you got a bad facelift. That's how I had him yelling at the camera. And that's how we got that picture, you know? So I'm trying to come up with something wacky. Um, but again, it's so that I'm not bored. You know what I mean? Like, as a, I think as an artist sometimes, you can get bored with your work. Same thing, musicians. Everybody kind of go, ah, I want something else. It's not hitting me. I'm not feeling it. So I constantly have to have, you know, ideas. Um, just always trying to come up with something new. And it's harder. It's harder but it's worth it when you, when you can pull it off. Yeah. Hi. On location? So a lot of it is a mixture of both. So I have like, I have a studio set up at my home just in case I get the bug to shoot something. And then a lot of times, I'm, it's on location, too. I'm able to take that setup right here if I wanted to. I could put up, I mean, any of us can do it. You can put up a little nine-foot roll of paper and have at it. You know what I mean? So it's, it's a mixture of both, on location and in the studio. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for all of this. But uh, when I point my camera at the people, like my friends, my family, people like instantly freeze up. They look so good, and then they see the camera, and they don't know what to do with themselves. How do you get people comfortable for those more candid moments? So that is the magic of direction. You get to be, you get to be the director. People don't think of it this way, but like, OK, so I'm not the photographer that has you stand there. OK, just do something. You know what I mean? It, because you don't know what to do. Like, I wouldn't know what to do if you told that to me, right? So um, that's, again, your concept in mind, right? So it's like, like, let's say my mom's cooking. All right, I'm taking pictures. This is different because that's more things as they're happening, right? If she stops to look at me, which she will, uh-uh, stop looking at me. I want you to keep stirring the spaghetti. And, it's, you know, and that's how, so it's direction. Essentially, that, I said it crazy like that, but it's direction. It's you have to give the subject's direction. I'm looking for this. I'm going to wrap your head with gauze, and I want you to scream because you got a bad facelift. So, you know, I, I have to give, um, give them examples, um, show them pictures, show them where you're trying to go. So it's all, all of this is wrapped up into one word, direction. I saw somebody else here. Oh. Yes. <laughs> hey. Hi. Uh, thank you for everything. No it was very inspirational. So basically, um, I love taking portraits as well. So I'm really into family portraits or individual portraits and documenting that time. So what do you recommend, like, if, I'm, if I have this very short window of five minutes, suppose, right? Should I uh, focus more on that classic, timeless portrait that individual can have and that may be remembered for versus a creative portrait that is going to be more likable or probably people may think of me as like, okay, he's a good photographer, but at the same time, there is this drive for creating that 
perfect, simple, classic portrait. Like, when you have that five moments, uh, five minutes of time, what do you, like, what do you go through, for example? Like, do you first take the classic portraits and then do those creative things, or you just, what's the goal usually? Okay, so I had a, I'm gonna answer this question because I've been there many times. Okay. I had a portrait of Jennifer Lawrence. Three minutes, y'all. Three minutes. And it wasn't three minutes because she was being a diva. They, it was a, what we call a press junket. So they cram all of these interviews. So TV, of course, is gonna get the priority, right? So you have TV, radio, and then I'm the only still guy. So I have three minutes, because everybody ate my time. I was supposed to have 15 minutes, and they're like, sorry, dude, you got three minutes. So, and why was it three minutes? Because she literally, after those three minutes, we're whisking her to the airport. She gotta go to LA. It was that fast. So, to answer your question, I would recommend that you, everybody in this room always has a go-to portrait setup. It's the go-to. It may not be this amazing picture, but you have a go-to picture where it will be decent at the minimum, right? So I had, a, I had a decent picture of her, and it turned out nice. I wish I could have done more because she's really down to earth, and she was willing to do more, but she only had three minutes, and it wasn't her. It was, we got to get her out of here. We, we're over the time. So anyway, that's, that's what I would say. Now, the other option, if you don't want to do the CYA, cover your, if you don't want, because that's what that picture is, the CYA picture. If you don't want to do that, then you need to immediately have the photo in your head that you're going to take. So when they, if you have three minutes or five minutes, you got to say, we're going to do this photo right here. Or have an example or know what you want to do with them. And you can do the special photo. You actually can do the special photo in five minutes or so. We had to do it with the Obamas. You only have five minutes to make this iconic picture. You have Michelle Obama. You only have five minutes, not 10, not 15. So you could do the CYA picture. In some cases, you may not be fulfilled. Or you can walk in with, I'm going to do this photo in my five minutes. So you be the, you're the, you're the, you make that choice. Yeah. Go to equipment. Um, it's usually like, you know, something simple like two lights. Um, it's, you know, soft box here and a fill light. Just, that's like the go-to light. The lighting's gonna be pretty. I know what it's gonna do. I know what the settings are because I've done it a million times. So that, that's what I would say. It's like two lights. Usually like a 20, I have a, um, it, it depends, but a lot of, if I'm doing, if I have time, if I have time, I'm gonna shoot the porches with an 85 um, millimeter. And then um, if I'm trying to do more of an environment picture, I'm gonna do like a 28 to 70 millimeter. You know what I mean? Um, or 50, it just depends on the, the space that I have with, you know. Oftentimes, I can't tell you how many times I take the 28 to 70 and I turn it to 50, or I turn it to 35. I'm not really zooming in, and I, I just pick, I pick the, you know, pick the lens and then that's it, yeah. Yeah, because a lot of times you can tell, like in this room, I would, you know, I would probably, if I want a wide shot, I know what that lens will be, yeah. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, you mentioned about nerves, especially when it comes to celebrities, uh, when you appreciate their work, and imposter syndrome at times. Uh, I'm curious, w because you do shoot tethered, uh, and somebody, you said the celebrity might test you and want to look at your work. For the ones that know more, like the directors, Ava, Jason Bateman, and George Clooney, us all up there, who know a little bit more, do you ever have uh, an incident where they're like, mm, let's change this? Um, and they kind of try to take over the directing role. Uh, I guess I'm trying to ask because what happens if I do shoot tether and somebody is just not appreciating the work that I'm seeing? And I'm going, no, that's good. How do you direct that? Okay, so once again, the gift of direction. And with a little bit of spice of manipulation. I'm gonna tell you what's the little magic potion stuff. So what I do is I'll walk you through the whole process. If you walk, okay, look, George, we're going to do this. You mind if I call you George? Okay, yeah, George. So we're going to, you know, we're doing this whole, I'm walking them through, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. We're gonna, and what's funny is they don't, you know, they're just going to go, oh, okay. <laughs> so I haven't, I, I don't run into 
too many. I mean, I've been lucky so far. I haven't run into too many control freaks. The other thing is, it, sometimes some of them probably are, but they're trying to make a good impression for, depending on what the shoot is for, right? You don't want to leave a bad impression when the Washington Post is right here, you know, so, and the writer's here or whatever. So I think I haven't run into, nope, I hate all of that. I hate, the, I haven't run into that, but that does exist. I just, I haven't really had, I had a photo shoot with Michael Keaton, and it was the day after his nephew died. So they told me in advance, don't talk too much, don't talk to him. He just lost his nephew, he's despondent about it. And, I, you know, and I'm like, oh my God, this is terrible. I was even, I couldn't believe he even did the shoot. You know, I couldn't believe it, but he was so committed to his work that he came in to do the press junket. He did the interview and he did the photo shoot. We had 10 minutes, but he, he did, he was fine. I didn't mess with him though, and I was nervous. But I was nervous and going, it's Batman! But I couldn't like, you know, go there. So I had to, I had to keep it calm. So it's kind of like knowing when the, you know, there's some give and take, y'all. I mean, I wish I had a better time with him, but hey, he, we ended up getting a nice picture anyway. So thank you so much, you know? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah.